Good afternoon. Welcome to another City Club Friday Forum. I'm Doug Marker, immediate past president of the City Club. Uh, just as a reminder, I'd ask you to turn off your cell phones and other electronic devices during our forum today. And as always, I have a few announcements. Our Friday Forum next week, May 11th, is the state of the world cities and what it means to Portland, or to, yes, what it means to Portland with former World Bank official Tim Campbell. On Thursday, May 10th, we have an Agora sustainability tour. Uh, the tour will lead a green, uh, be a green tour of the Pearl District on May 10th, providing an introduction to green building. The tour will take a walk to nearby Tanner Springs Park and the EcoTrust building for a presentation about the range of people, resources, and projects that keep Portland in the front line of sustainable design. On May, Monday, May 14th, Agora presents The Big Look. We invite you to join other City Club members and guests at a free public discussion about three of the most high-profile looks and vision in the Portland area. That'll be on May 14th from 5.30 to 7 o'clock p.m. at City Club Commons. In spring, we like to encourage things to grow. And at City Club, we like to see the club grow with new members to refresh and enliven the quality of all we do here. So today, we are encouraging current members to invite friends and colleagues to join City Club. Member Al Jubitz is offering an incentive. All new members who join between now and the end of May will receive a voucher for a lunch ticket to any Friday Forum this year. And furthermore, the current member who recruits the new member will also receive a voucher. Last year, our 10-week spring drive brought in 93 new members, and we'd like to see if we can do even better this year. Our sponsors this quarter are Schwabe, Williamson & Wyatt, and Key Bank. Would you join me in th thanking our sponsors? To our program, how we learn what we learn about national and world events has changed dramatically in recent years. On one hand, the explosion of the internet has made a variety of information sources available to those with the time and resources to look for them. On the other hand, traditional media, especially newspapers and television, have become increasingly concentrated among a few corporate owners. As an example, just this week, Rupert Murdoch, the chair of the corporation that owns Fox News, announced a bid to buy the company that owns the Wall Street Journal. As our chief sources of news are concentrated in fewer hands, what does this say about how we get our information and how we make decisions, particularly on such major issues as the war in Iraq and the economy? Jeff Cohen is the founder of FAIR, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting. FAIR is a media watch group that monitors how events are reported by today's newspapers and t television networks. He was an on-air commentator on MSNBC before being terminated three weeks before the U.S. invasion of Iraq. In 2003, he was communications director of the Kucinich for President's campaign. Here to talk to us about diversity and accuracy of information in today's media is Jeff Cohen. Jeff. Thank you, Doug. It's great to be here at the City Club. It's great to be in Portland. I traveled all over the country. I've never, ever found a city that was as friendly as Portland. Um, my brother and sister-in-law are here, Ron and Chris. They're Oregonians. They have me speaking in Hood River on Sunday afternoon at Columbia Arts Center. It's a good thing that I got here on time, and the only reason I succeeded was I decided not to return to Powell Books this morning because I was there uh, yesterday afternoon and it, it took me three and a half hours to find my way out of the store. Uh, today I'm going to discuss media fact and fiction by tracing my very unusual evolution from media critic to TV pundit. I founded FAIR, I was a ferocious critic of television news, and then as if in a slow motion nightmare over a period of years, I woke up and I found myself embedded inside the mainstream media. Alice fell down a rabbit hole, I fell into the muck of cable news. In our country, we have these half a dozen corporations that are sitting on the windpipe of the First Amendment, restricting the flow of information, restricting the spectrum of viewpoints. And through corrupt policy made behind closed doors, 
these corporations have been handed public property, the public's airwaves. I know these companies pretty well, having taken paychecks from three of them. I was an on-air pundit on all the cable news channels until, as Doug mentioned, I was terminated for political reasons right before the Iraq invasion. The good news in my story is that I'm a rare media critic who got inside the news outlets I was condemning. The bad news is that I had to share my adventures in TV news with the loud mouths who dominate it, which means I was on show after show with the Hannity's and the O'Reilly's and the Novak's and the Jerry Falwell's. Thankfully, I was able to avoid Ann Coulter. <laughs> what does it say about television news today that the two most important programs of news and politics are on the comedy channel? I'll never forget one personal episode. I was at Fox News, a regular, uh, October 99. General Musharraf has his military coup in Pakistan. And immediately, India, which fears this general, goes on high military alert. So does Pakistan, which has just successfully tested nuclear weapons. These two countries, India and Pakistan, are on high military alert, meaning high nuclear alert, and I go into my normal weekly show at Fox News, and what's the first segment we discuss? John Benet Ramsey. Second segment completely devoted to O.J. Simpson. He was back in the news because he'd had a domestic dispute with his girlfriend in Florida. Our third and final segment, we debated whether it was appropriate for a character on the Law and Order series to use the term Lewinsky as a synonym for a sex act. No mention of India, Pakistan nukes. I walk out of the studio and what pops into my head is that ironic bumper sticker from the 1980s, one nuclear bomb can ruin your whole day. But I thought it should be updated for TV news. One nuclear bomb can ruin your whole day, but who cares? OJ's back in the news. I've come to believe that the owners of television news would be just as happy if we were a nation of mindless consumers rather than a nation of informed, active citizens. That's why TV news channels often function as weapons of mass distraction. Most Americans cannot identify their member of Congress, but they're often experts on the news stories that television obsesses upon, like Alec Baldwin and Kim Basinger, Anna Nicole Smith, Britney Spears, whether uh, Paris Hilton's going to end up behind bars. There are important reasons that TV news devotes so much time to those tabloid stories, lurid crime, sex, celebrity. Number one, they're very, very cheap to cover. You don't have to send out reporters to actually dig stuff up. The lawyers want to see their faces on TV and they'll come and speculate about someone's guilt or innocence for free for hours. Number two, these stories don't offend anyone powerful. You'll never lose a sponsor. You won't polarize with the Bush administration by covering tabloid. My career in television began about 20 years ago when I was a semi-regular guest on what was then the most raucous, loudest, biggest TV news debate show. It was Crossfire on CNN. And people used to ask me, why do you go on a show where you can rarely finish a sentence or two without being interrupted? And my stock answer was, I'd never found anywhere else you could be seated in a chair for a half hour without moving. And after the 30 minutes, just from the shouting, you'd had a complete aerobic workout. <laughs> when Crossfire was going off the air for ratings, lack of ratings, MSNBC was starting a new show for the former Republican Congressman Joe Scarborough. And according to Scarborough, a network executive took him aside and said, if you let someone talk for more than seven seconds on your show without interruption, then you're a failure. So you see, things are getting worse, not better. In 96, I was tested to be the permanent co-host from the left on Crossfire. The producers liked me, TV critics liked me, but I didn't get the CNN job because I ran up against this unwritten rule that you can't represent the American left every night on TV if you're actually on the left. Because see, what TV prefers is a debate between a conservative Republican and a conservative Democrat, which I guess has a certain amount of symmetry, but on many issues it's leaving half of the political spectrum voiceless. It's a spectrum no wider than from GE to GM. At CNN, it was obvious 
when I was being tested for the job that management was concerned that I might be critical of our corporate sponsors. And at the time, the main sponsor of CNN's Crossfire was General Electric. People wrongly blame Fox News for this standard format that we see on the Sunday shows, on the primetime shows, this standard format where you have a fire-breathing, principled right-winger debating a backpedaling, vacillating, barely left of center liberal. On Fox News, it's Hannity and Combs. But that format was established before there was Fox News. It was established by PBS and CNN. And I write about this extensively in the new book, exactly what is the spectrum. FAIR recruited thousands of people to our organization and to subscribe to our magazine by running full page ads where it would have pictures of the people that represented the left on TV. And our banner headline in the ad was, I'm not a leftist, but I play one on TV. I got my on-air screen test at Crossfire in 1996 because Michael Kinsley had left. Every night for six years, he announced, I'm Michael Kinsley from the left. And it was somewhat controversial uh, because many people didn't think he was their advocate. And a Washington Post reporter said, well, Michael, how would you describe your own politics? And he described himself, I believe accurately, as a wishy-washy moderate, unquote. My friend Jim Hightower said, sending Michael Kinsley into debates with the Sununus and the Novaks and Buchanans was a little bit like sending Tweety Bird into a cockfight. <laughs> After my failed tryout at CNN, my TV career was salvaged ironically enough, by Rupert Murdoch and this new thing he was starting, Fox News Channel. Uh, I, I give some of this inside stuff in the book about Fox News. Suffice it to say that being a progressive at Fox News is a little bit like being a feminist at the Augusta National Golf Club. <laughs> Rupert Murdoch hired the media operative Roger Ailes to be the Fox News chair. Now, he had no experience in journalism, but he had a lot of experience in making 30-second attack ads aimed at Democrats. Indeed, there was no one in the business better than him. And I believe that um, in Murdoch's mind, when he was hiring Ailes, he's thinking, God, if this guy can accomplish so much in 30 seconds, imagine what he could do 24-7 with a TV so-called news channel. And I don't want to give the impression that Murdoch dislikes all Democrats because last July he held a uh, benefit and endorsed Hillary Clinton for Senate. I think he believes she's pretty good to the process of media conglomeration. I mentioned Fox News' debate show earlier, Hannity and Combs. When I was there, I heard that a top executive at Fox had said to a, a number of staff members who are colleagues of mine, you know who the best host is at this channel? It's Alan Combs. He knows what his job is, and he does it. His job is to make Hannity look good, unquote. I appeared every weekend for five years on the Fox News Media Criticism Show, and then I left in 2002 because I was sure I would get a better platform for my punditry if I went to a more middle-of-the-road channel. So I headed over to MSNBC, run by the top news division, uh, NBC News, and it turned out I would have been far better off staying at Fox. And that says something about television news today. During my career, during the years I was on the inside, I worked with some great people in mainstream media and mainstream TV news. But these were almost always the lower or middle level journalists, often young, energetic, public minded, conscientious, but ultimately powerless and never more powerless than in a time of war. These mainstream news outlets are strict corporate hierarchies, which means at Fox News, everyone who works there knows that the power is at the top with Roger Ailes and Rupert Murdoch. When you work at MSNBC, the power is ultimately with the owner, and the owner is General Electric, a conservative corporation, a major military contractor. In our country, it's common to hear people across the political spectrum, especially conservatives, though, saying that they favor a meritocracy, a system in which advancement is based on individual achievement and ability. But what I found in mainstream media is that we have the exact opposite. The dictionary has a word for it. It's one of my favorite words lately. It's cacistocracy. Literally, it means rule by the worst. 
It's where the least principled and least qualified people rise to the top. I saw this in the mainstream media during the Iraq War, and it's very personal for me and very emotional for me. Those of us who forcefully challenge the evidence that Iraq was some sort of imminent threat, those of us who warned of the chaos that would follow from a U.S. invasion, many of us, because of that, because we function journalistically and skeptically, we've been spat out of the media system. But if you echoed the official deceptions, whether out of gullibility or ideology, you've largely seen your career flourish. I'm not aware of a single TV news executive or, or pundit or so-called expert who lost their job for getting such a huge story so totally wrong as almost every one of them did. When I was at MSNBC, there was a particularly hawkish host. He did lose his show. Why? Because he was kicked upstairs. Now he's the general manager of the whole channel. I'm talking about Dan Abrams. Those who rise to the top in the mainstream media are often much better at corporate politics, not irritating the powers that be, the advertisers, the, the media owners. They're much better at that than they are at independent journalism. In the summer of 2002, I debated and opposed an invasion of Iraq week after week on MSNBC, but then as the war grew nearer, they took my airtime away. And I was replaced by non-debate segments. The rule for me was I couldn't debate the weather without being uh, on, in, in the segment having at least one fire-breathing right-winger. But when my debate segments ended, they were replaced by non-debate segments with the retired colonels, the retired generals, the former CIA officers passing themselves off as weapons experts. These people never had to be in debates because they were presented as independent objective experts. But over at CNN at this very time, the news president admitted that he'd gotten prior government approval of CNN's military analysts. He boasted about it on the air, his consultations with the Pentagon. This is what he said. I went to the Pentagon several times before the war, and I met with important people there and said, here are the generals we're thinking of retaining to advise us on the air and off about the war. We got a big thumbs up on all of them. That was important, unquote. Virtually everything these experts said unopposed in the media turned out to be wrong. After no weapons were found, it was fascinating to hear the excuses of the mainstream media's so-called experts, and I have these in my book. One of the mainstream media experts was the former CIA officer, Brookings Fellow today, Kenneth Pollack. He pushed relentlessly for an invasion on program after program. He went on Oprah's program and told that huge audience that Saddam could use weapons against us in our own homeland. Afterward, he was asked, how could you get it so wrong? And remember, he was introduced show after show as the expert. He said, quote, that was not me making that claim. That was me parroting the claims of the so-called experts, unquote. Has Pollack retired in shame as a media analyst? No, he's still a media regular. I saw him quoted some weeks ago in a front page New York Times story explaining why it's reckless to even talk about withdrawing troops from Iraq. Now TV is a visual medium that's drummed into your head and anyone who's worked in TV knows they tell you about visuals. They want dramatic visuals. That's why you get the crime and the fires and the floods and the chase footage. But every staffer in television news knows that there's exceptions to the rules. And one exception to the rule about dramatic footage is war footage, especially civilian victims of US military actions or weapons. We don't see such images on our television news, but they're shown all over the world. We can tell ourselves that the reason our country is hated in so many parts of the globe is because women here wear short skirts or criminal defendants get their Miranda rights. And maybe that makes us feel good, but part of the reason we're hated in many parts of the globe is because our policies are killing innocent people and we're the only country in the world that doesn't get those basic facts. When the United States invaded Afghanistan in October 2001, CNN executives sent memos to their anchors and their staff, their correspondents, demanding that if any image of a civilian 
victim in Afghanistan were shown, it would have to have softening commentary. And the memos leaked out. One of the memos was giving the exact wording that the anchors were supposed to give and ended up giving. And the memo said something like, this may start sounding rote, but you have to say, quote, US military actions are in response to terrorist attacks that claim thousands of lives. This is October 2001. Is there any American who'd forgotten that 911 had just happened? When these memos leaked out, and thank God for whistleblowers, Washington Post went to one of the authors of uh, one of these memos and, uh, and asked him about it, and he said this. It was Walter Isaacson, who was, I think his, his title then was CNN chair. He said, it seems perverse to focus too much on the casualties or hardships in Afghanistan, unquote. We lost 3,000 civilians. Tens of thousands of innocent civilians have died in these countries that we don't know about. I think one of the main biases of mainstream media, and it goes from the New York Times to Fox News, is what academics call ethnocentrism. It's this idea that the lives and deaths of US citizens simply matter more than the lives and deaths of citizens overseas, especially dark-skinned people overseas. In the mainstream media during the run-up to the Iraq invasion, some of us tried hard to get the questions, the tough questions asked and answered. At MSNBC, I was not just a pundit, I was a senior producer on the primetime Donahue show. But remember what I had said about media outlets being strict corporate hierarchies. In the last months of Donahue, we were given strict orders that every time we booked one guest who was anti-war, we had to book two that were pro-war. If we booked two guests on the left, we had to book three on the right. At one meeting, a producer said she was thinking of booking Michael Moore, and she was told for political balance she would need three right-wingers. I thought about proposing Noam Chomsky as a guest, but our, I think you might know the problem. Our stage couldn't accommodate the 28 right-wingers we would have needed. Weeks before the invasion of Iraq, I did my last appearance on MSNBC. It was to debate Frank Gaffney. He lives on TV news. He's a former Reagan defense official, neoconservative. Now, Gaffney had convinced someone at MSNBC to let him on the air to give yet one more reason why we had to invade Iraq. And he told the viewers of MSNBC that not only was Saddam behind 9-11, but that Iraq was somehow behind Tim McVeigh and the Oklahoma City bombing. I swear to God. It wasn't one of my proudest moments of it, as a TV pundit when I said on the air that Gaffney was in need of psychiatric care. Uh, as I say, it was my last appearance, but the Gaffneys and the Falwells and the Ann Coulters, no matter how inaccurate, how consistently wrong they are, they live on TV. In fact, these people seem to have no meaningful existence apart from television. The more off they are factually, the more on they are. Many media voices who were totally wrong about Iraq are now using their media platforms to push for a military confrontation with Iran. How many people, and, and Gaffney is one of these, he denounces the appeasers of Iran. How many people have seen on CNN's headline news, The Glenn Beck Show? Yeah, no one will admit it. For those who, for those who, I see people shaking their head, heads in hand. If you haven't seen it for months, it was basically target Iran. You know, is, here's a guy who knows nothing about the Middle East, bringing on experts that all sing the same song. And, you know, he's, he places Iran behind every evil in the world except male pattern baldness. And he's working on that connection. But right now, thankfully, he's not on Iran anymore. He's proving that Al Gore and the scientists are wrong about global warming. Primetime CNN. How did he get this job? What were his credentials to get that job? Why didn't Amy Goodman get that job? Why didn't some journalist who does their research get those jobs? He got his job because he, I guess, had been so accurate about invading Iraq. He was just pushing for an invasion. He said on the air, he was a clear channel, Glenn Beck, a clear channel talk radio screamer. He fantasized on the air for the violent deaths of Congressman Dennis Kucinich and Michael Moore. When Cindy Sheehan surfaced, 
in the public's view. He called her the big prostitute. And it was, I guess, those credentials that now makes him an expert about Iran because he got Iraq so wrong. One expert who was proven right about Iraq is the former Marine, former weapons ex inspector, current Republican Scott Ritter. And when we would talk about booking Scott Ritter on the Donahue show, show in late 2002, whenever we would talk about it and the word would get out that we were thinking about booking Scott Ritter, we would hear these smears come almost like clockwork, sometimes whispered, haven't you guys heard that uh, there's these rumors that he's, he's getting covert government funding from Saddam Hussein's government? And it was a smear to take a very articulate dissenter off the air, and believe me, he was taken off the air, and he's not on the air anymore. And an interesting thing about that is I learned a couple years later that one of the right-wingers I regularly debated on MSNBC was, in fact, a recipient of covert government funds. I'm, uh, the covert government funder was the Bush administration. The S Department of Education was funding Armstrong Williams nearly a quarter million dollars to promote the No Child Left Behind Act. And uh, I think you can tell from my point of view why I wasn't invited into Bush's No Pundit Left Behind program. <laughs> Somehow they funded the No Pundit Left Behind program better than they funded No Child Left Behind. It would be a mistake to say that mainstream media did not have debates about the war. There are always debates about war. The problem is the narrowness of their focus. What mainstream media likes is debates about tactics. Did we have enough troops? Was the invasion planned well enough? Did we think through the occupation? Tactical debates are what they want. What they don't want is debates about morality of foreign policy or motives of foreign policy. If you say that this war, this invasion, had less to do with weapons or freedom and democracy for the people of Iraq, but it had something to do with military bases in the Middle East or oil or purely geopolitical strategy to get into the Middle East or domestic political considerations at home. If you say any of those things, if you question the motives of the invasion, then you're not ready for television and that's why Phil Donahue was silenced. My friend Dennis Kucinich got on TV before the invasion and he said the rationales being given for why we need to rush to invade Iraq make no sense. I can only conclude that oil is the real reason for the invasion. And two days later, a Washington Post columnist, one of their liberal columnists, was fuming about Kucinich. He wrote, how did this fool get on Meet the Press? Of course, only a fool could question whether corporate interests or oil interests influence U.S. foreign policy. Only a fool and hundreds and hundreds of academics who've spent their years studying the matter. In 2003, when Donahue was terminated, on the eve of the war, it was MSNBC's most watched program. That doesn't happen a lot. Oberman is the most watched program today, which gives him a certain amount of security, but as we learned with Donahue, he's got the same management, the same owners. It's not total security. The day after we were terminated, an, in an internal NBC memo leaked out that was never supposed to be public, and it gave the explanation of what had been happen happening to us for months. It said, Donahue represents a difficult public face for NBC in a time of war. He seems to delight in presenting guests who are anti-war, anti-Bush, and skeptical of the administration's motives, unquote. There's that problem with motives. The memo described NBC's nightmare scenario where Donahue would become, quote, a home for the liberal anti-war agenda at the same time that our competitors are waving the flag at every opportunity, unquote. What did we learn from this period? How many people saw the Bill Moyers documentary on the media and war? I think what we learned from this period is if you're so busy waving flags, you don't have the energy you need to do your job as a journalist, which is to ask the tough questions before our young men and women are sent overseas to kill or be killed. I want to finish with a couple minutes of optimism. Um, because the book is optimistic, if, you, if you, some of you have the book already. There really are great things happening in the mainstream media. They may not be happening in, in uh, corporate media except in the margins. 
But the great news is that independent media are booming, never been bigger. And it's a migration of news consumers away from traditional media. People were fed up with the cheerleading coverage, the jingoism on our mainstream TV networks before the war, and they were trying to get BBC, which wasn't great, but it was much better than our channels. And people have moved looking for alternatives. There are blogs that started in 2002 that now have millions of visitors, like Tom Tomorrow's blog, This Modern World. Independent websites never been bigger, whether it's alternet.org or commondreams.org. Alternative uh, radio shows, for example, Alternative Radio with David Barsamian, or Amy Goodman's Democracy Now! has gone from radio to television, never been bigger. And even old line independent media, like The Nation, which is pretty much the oldest publication in the country, you know their joke, George Bush, may be horrible for the country, but he's been great for the nation. Their, their circulation's near, uh, near the roof. The internet has been a key to the growth of independent media, and not just internet-based media. Robert Greenwald, the documentary maker, how many people have seen Outfoxed or Iraq for Sale? Now, he can market his movies with the internet. He doesn't have a TV network behind him or a movie studio. He uses the internet to market the movies. He uses the internet to raise the money to make the movies. When they released Outfoxed in the middle of 2004, it was a higher selling DVD on Amazon than the uh, Star Wars trilogy box set. Number one seller on Amazon.com. And there's a reason that the demagogues from talk radio and talk TV can't participate too well and can't grow on the internet because the internet is really a medium of debate and small d democracy. If you're a blogger and you criticize something, you link to who you're criticizing and then they'll come back at you. And then you invite the, the people that are watching that debate to join the debate. Now a guy like Limbaugh, a guy like O'Reilly, uh, they're not very good in factual debates. And the media reform movement is also booming. And that's a key ingredient to why the media are changing. In 2003, at the same time that the TV networks were cheerleading for war, their lobbyists were going to the Bush administration trying to get the FCC rules changed to allow the media titans to become even more titanic. And the word got out, thanks to the internet. And it led to the biggest insurrection on a media policy issue in the history of the country. And thanks to a court decision and the mobilization that got Congress to undo some of what the FCC had done, the FCC was stymied. It's unheard of in, in, in history. Media policy is usually determined by closed doors with the media company lobbyists and the FCC. And now this media reform movement is taking the offensive saving the internet from the clutches of the big cable and big phone companies. If you're interested in that campaign, save the internet.com. And media activism of all kind is increasing. People don't, uh, people are more active news consumers and that's a great thing. 20 years ago when we started FAIR, we were a little bit quixotic when we developed our slogan and uh, we used to say, don't take the mainstream media lying down. But I'm happy to say that in 2007, it's not really quixotic to use that kind of a slogan. Thank you very much, and I'm open for questions. Thank you, Jeff. And we will now open the floor for questions from City Club members. The first question will be asked by our board host, Larry Wallach. Larry is Dean of the College of Urban and Public Affairs at Portland State University. Larry. Thank you, Doug. And uh, thanks, Jeff, for that great talk and also for all the terrific work you've done. I want to challenge your optimism a bit. <laughs> Mistrust of concentrated power is deeply ingrained in the American culture, yet in the early 80s, based on Ben Bagdikian's book, Media Monopoly, 50 corporations controlled over 50% of all the media outlets. Today, only five corporations control over 90% of the media outlets. It seems like we're almost at the end of the road, and I'm wondering if we've turned the corner yet. 
What is some hopeful advice from you on how this enormous concentration of corporate power could somehow be addressed? Yeah, that's a good question. I remember when Ben Bagdikian put out his first edition of the Media Monopoly, and I think he wrote it in, in uh, 1982 or 83. And the subheadline was the 50 five zero corporations that control what Americans see, hear, and read through the media. And the book reviewers in the mainstream dailies were calling him an alarmist. And he's a little bit paranoid. And, uh, and then a few years ago, Time merged with Warner. And at their news conference, a reporter said, well, why did you take this step to one of the uh, CEOs? And he said, well, we know in the not too distant future, a half a dozen corporations will control the media. And we took this step to make sure we would be one of them. So yes, at the corporate level, things are, uh, are more and more conglomerated. The media content is more and more tabloid and jingoistic and empty. Uh, the good news is the internet, that these independent media are growing. But how do we address the, the issue of what's at the center of our media, which is these corporations? I think the way you address it is the way they uh, created the problem in the first place, which is controlling the political system. There's, the only way to break up the media monopoly is to elect different people to Congress and different people into the White House. And then it's not rocket science how you divide up the media. In fact, I was speaking a couple weeks ago in Huntsville, Alabama, which is you know, the rocket center of the world, and I kept saying, it's not rocket science, and you know, <laughs> there were about 10 rocket scientists in the audience. But uh, you know, it's not hard. In the back of Cable News Confidential, I list some of the media reforms that we need. I mean, you know, in, in, at the time Bagdekian wrote his first edition, the rule at the FCC was 777, that one individual and one company in the whole country could only own seven television stations, seven AM radio, and seven FM. Now you got to the point where Clear Channel's got more than 1,000, and they have more than seven in many different cities. So I, I think you need to reimpose limits. Those are the public's airwaves. Every court case has ruled that that's our property every bit as much as a national forest or a national park. So we can do what we want with those licenses. We can go, I know you know Bob McChesney's work, the professor of media history. In the 1930s, there was a movement afoot to take 25% of the licenses and give them to nonprofit groups, colleges, schools, uh, labor unions. There's no reason we can't move in that direction, minority owners. I'll tell you my favorite, and, and one thing we really need is genuine public broadcasting where the politicians can't turn the money on and off. Our system of public TV and radio is deformed because they get to turn the money on and off. And there's all these plans, and if we change Congress and change the White House, we could change the public broadcasting system so they don't take corporate money. And they're amply funded uh, by perhaps making those who get all these licenses to broadcast, maybe make them pay a little bit for the licenses instead of getting them free. Again, it's not rocket science. It's very easy. Uh, so uh, let me get other questions. Well. You, you, now you've made me this Tom Cox, a uh, proud City Club member, and I think the only Republican in the room. <laughs> Sorry, one of two, right on. Uh, and this answer you just gave made me wonder about how you're suggesting that more government control of the media would somehow lead to greater independence, that the politicians couldn't turn the money off if only they had more control over it. It, it seems a little odd. The consolidation you talk about seems like it's the same consolidation we see in other declining or plateaued industries, like the manufacturing of televisions is now controlled by about four companies in the world. When railroads were declining, they were consolidating as well. You see the, the revenue of television news is declining, and you're seeing in, in newspapers as well. Uh, as they shrink, they consolidate, and at the same time, consumers are being served by this explosion of new media that completely bypass that old approach. Uh, I, I'm not seeing the, the underlying either conspiracy or cause for alarm in what you're talking about. Your first question first, which is control over the media. Right now, a half, right now the government controls. How do they control? Because they've given the licenses to Rupert Murdoch, Viacom. There's nothing worse than government bestowing all this media power on a handful of giant corporations. I've heard few Republicans complain about it. 
um, if we had independent public broadcasting that the politicians could not control, like in other countries, you could make sure that on the governing board of public broadcasting, the rights represented the left, business, labor. It's not hard to devise a system that's more diverse and more independent than the one we have that's controlled by Disney, Murdoch, and Viacom, all done in uh, backroom deals with the politicians turning over the power to those handful. Um, I agree with you that in many ways, old, uh, but you know, old media are shrinking in clout as independent media using especially the internet to market or raise funds is growing. There's no doubt about it. It's a great thing. Unfortunately, television is still the dominant medium in society, and it will be the dominant medium. And I'm not going to allow a few corporations to dominate that medium when it's the public's airwaves. So I think that while some great things are happening, we still need to use media reform in a content-neutral way. The last thing I want is for the government to mandate uh, content. And all of, the, all of the reforms I've proposed and that are in, uh, at the end of my book are all content-neutral. And I'll give you my favorite one, which is, let everyone take $100, $150 off of their federal taxes, and I would think a Republican would like tax reduction. And take this money and allow each individual to donate that money to the nonprofit media outlet of their choice. Now, maybe it's Pacifica, maybe you like the pro-life newsletter or the NRA newsletter. You just donate your money. It would get hundreds of millions of dollars going into diverse media in a completely content-neutral way, which means it's First Amendment kosher, and uh, that, that kind of thing, and it reduces taxes. So uh, that kind of thing is obvious, because right now we have a lot of government subsidy, taxpayer subsidy of the media. You give your taxes, you subsidize the, its public property, the airwaves, and it's handed over to Rupert Murdoch and Disney. That's the worst kind of public subsidy. I, I fear you might get the Britney Spears channel instead, but, but I like the idea. I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah, no, we've got the Britney Spears channel. It's called MSNBC, <laughs> CNN, and Fox News. That's thanks to corporate control. Right. And, and the spelling on cathistocracy. I love that word. I need to be able to spell it. Thank you. K-A-K-I. Man, I feel like I'm a young kid in the spelling bee. K-A-K-I. Stocracy, S T O C, yeah, R A C Y. Chris Allman, City Club member. Um, I would like you to expand on your comments of um, we don't have the debate of moral policy or um, motives, and I'm I'm coming from the perspective of being an education activist, and as we are approaching, um, as a bill is being considered, um, uh, Senate Joint Memorial 12, uh, that would try to, uh, here in Oregon, try to disconnect from the mandates um, of No Child Left Behind, yet still get the money. Um, we still have to figure out how do we get these debates out there, and how do, we, how, do we, how do we do this, aside from the fact that we have problems with mainstream media? It's really difficult. I mean, the, the media debates on every topic, I just think war and foreign policy are the narrowest, but they're always too narrow. It's because of who's in the pundit class. You know, the, the pundit class just isn't broad. It's a very narrow group of people that have very parochial concerns, and they accept the bias of the system as good. You know, no matter whether you're on the right or the so-called left in the media spectrum, you don't question assumptions. And I've seen very little questioning of no child left behind. It's just, you know, and there's nothing worse for the country as a whole in terms of wanting a debate when the leadership of the two parties agree on something. Then it's deadly. Like, uh, you know, I grew up, I was a youngster during the Vietnam War when the media were just cheerleaders for that war. And in fact, as I write in my book, I was gung-ho for the Vietnam War. I wanted to save our country from communism. And I got my news from television news. And the problem was that it was the Democrats that were prosecuting the war, and the Republicans were in a bipartisan consensus, the same thing that you always hear the pundits laud. Wow, it's great bipartisanship this weekend. I hear that from a pundit I had under the table. And when there's bipartisanship in Washington, then the establishment media feels, well, there's no real debate here. 
There's no need for independent journalism because God, the, the whole spectrum agrees from Rahm Emanuel and Chuck e. Schumer over here to the Republicans. So what can, how can we do any independent journalism? There's no, there's no real contest. That's dangerous. And of course, there were a lot of Democrats that supported that bill, and some of them still do. Ann Colonna, City Club member. I'd like to hear your opinion on programs like the Jim uh, Laird News Hour, Washington Week, Foreign Exchange, and John Stewart. And if you don't like those programs, what would you tell somebody who actually still prefers to pick up a newspaper rather than getting their news off the internet? Um, I would say if you want to pick up a daily newspaper, they're certainly more serious than television news, the Oregonian or the Seattle Times or the LA Times, but the newspapers are uh, cutting staff for the most part, cutting their reach relying on other people to gather their foreign news. That's the limitations of the daily press, and I, of course, encourage everyone to read a daily paper. I do believe you've got to go to the internet. I mean, I, I use for one-stop shopping, the, the one site that is my homepage is commondreams.org. I've never seen anything that touches it. It's the best of the mainstream media, the best of the independent media, and European and Israeli media. It's all in one place. I think you've got to go to the internet. As for uh, the PBS NewsHour, FAIR has done study after study after study. Their guest list is center-right. It's a, a corporate-favored guest list. They, uh, FAIR did a recent study of the NewsHour in the three months, the last three months of 05 and the first three months of 06, there was huge sentiment in that, at that time for getting our troops out of Iraq. But fair study showed that every time the news hour on so-called public TV debated Iraq, for every one advocate of withdrawing troops, there were five stay the course advocates. That's not a debate. And uh, Washington Week in Review, you know, we call it Washington Meek in review. It's again, it's the bipartisan consensus. It's, it's the kind of pundits who've been in Washington too long, don't question their sources enough. The beauty of the internet is people understand, gee, this is how it was intended to be. That these people who run blogs and websites, they may wear their biases on their sleeve, they may not have giant resources, but you know that they're really doing journalism and they're willing to say what's on their mind and they're, they're willing to say what they dig up. And that's the attraction. It's like the pamphleteers that founded our country, Tom Paine. Um, and in every time there's been any movement forward in our country, and I think we're in one of those movements, by the way, that's why I am optimistic. I think there's like a political shift happening in our country. We are in a Watergate moment right now. Um, and it's just, if only the Democratic Party leadership had backbone, things would really move forward. But when you're in a, a moment like this, independent media is usually a key part of it. They were a big part of the abolitionist movement. They were a big part of the suffragist movement, the populist movement. Every time there's movements from below, independent media flourishes. In even the time of our revolution in 1776. That's when, and now we have this technological breakthrough of the internet and independent journalism is booming because of it. It's a combination of technology, uh, politics, and some good things are happening. The best two news shows, in my view, are Jon Stewart and Colbert. You can learn more. You can learn more from those shows than watching TV news, and indeed, their sound bites are longer. You know, if an average sound bite on a TV news show, Brian Williams, Katie Couric, it's like nine seconds. They'll give you nine seconds of President Bush. But what does uh, uh, Stewart do? He'll give you like 15 seconds, make a joke about it, then show you 20 more seconds, make a joke about it. Before you know it, you've seen about a minute and a half of the president. You can't get that anywhere except C-SPAN and Jon Stewart. And then, of course, Colbert is, I think, the most brilliant satirist alive today. And I say this even though they didn't let me on their show to hype my book. So. <laughs> Uh, Janice Thompson, City Club member. Um, how would the shows that you were on, the new shows, be different if the fairness doctrine was still in place? And you mentioned, you know, even though there's a shift in Congress, not necessarily the backbone, do you think there's much chance of that uh, fairness doctrine being kind of reintroduced at the congressional level? I think the fairness doctrine has already been reintroduced. 
Uh, remember, it, uh, it was ended during the Reagan era. And I'll never forget how odd it was. At the beginning of FAIR, you know, we were supporters, obviously, of the Fairness Doctrine, and we still are. And on the far right wing, people know Phyllis Schlafly of the Eagle Forum and the Accuracy in Media. They would take out full-page ads, we need to save and enforce the Fairness Doctrine. And then a couple years later, I noticed that Phyllis Schlafly and Accuracy in Media, they weren't supporting the Fairness Doctrine anymore. And I would debate these people, all, you know, and they would say, oh, it's an infringement on the free market, it's the government. I said, well, wasn't it that in 1986, 87, 88, when you were running these full-page ads about saving the Fairness Doctrine? Or, you know, 83, 84, they were big on it. So the reality is that they saw the right-wing takeover of broadcasting, and they didn't want anything that might interfere and mandate some sort of uh, opposing views. Um, the Fairness Doctrine doesn't do a lot, but it's great to have it on the books. Uh, I think media management will rethink whether they have like one right-wing voice after another with their radio license going through the airwaves. They may rethink that and move toward a little bit of diversity. So yes, there is a plan. I think it's already been reintroduced by uh, Louise Slaughter, Congresswoman from New York, and my congressman from upstate New York, Maurice Hinchy. My name is Tom Madison. I'm with the City Club. I'm a bit disappointed that you didn't spend more time on the local hype and hysteria TV and radio channels here in the Portland areas across the nation. As you're probably aware, the hype and hysteria is what generates the revenues for these stations, and nothing's more disgusting to, to listen to all of the different kinds of hype that they use to get an audience. One of the most uh, outrageous is the sexual predator uh, announcements that, uh, again, try to scare the public when, in fact, the facts are so different than what they portray. What's your take on things like that as tactics to steal audiences away from other venues? Yeah, I think that local TV news is so scary, it makes CNN and Fox look good. I mean, the... Uh, and I mean, local TV news, I've written about it in earlier books, you know, the motto is not a joke, if it bleeds, it leads. And I think the, the movie that said the most about how local TV news uses fear to not only attract audience, but make sure the audience sticks with them after the commercials. Uh, the movie that did that so great was Bowling for Columbine, Michael Moore's what I consider his most important movie. And it shows, it uses like a seven minute segment on lo about local and national news, just using these scares. And obviously fear sells. If you, if you can't do serious reporting about the powers that be in our country, and that's often blocked because of commercial ownership and sponsorship, then all you really have is the tabloid celebrity stuff or the fear mongering. So they can take even a health story and turn it into pure, a new form of cancer. Might you be susceptible? <laughs> Stay tuned after these five minutes of commercials. And you know, and, and they'll like the way they tease, there's nothing sleazier than the tease. And it's always like a possible breakthrough in cancer that your grandma has. <laughs> All the details at eleven. You know, it's like if there's a real breakthrough in cancer, wouldn't you like it if the channel would actually suspend all normal programming and tell you what the fact is so you don't have to watch the commercials? But it's always fear, and I, I do a lot of work with high school kids and, and younger, and I know in Oregon, and, and I've been in the state of Washington speaking, there's so many exciting things happening with media literacy, which is teaching kids in elementary school, especially girls, but girls and boys, how to see through ads how not to be manipulated. All ads are is fear. Fear that you're too fat, you don't look right, your breath is bad, your underarms are bad, your between the legs are bad, you're not, you know, and it's just, if they don't make you feel fearful about how you look or how rich you are, they can't get you to pay attention to the product. And there's nothing more important in our public schools that we teach media literacy. And uh, there's great guides for it. There's a group in Western Mass called the Media Education Foundation that puts out videos. This is what we need to be doing to fortify our kids who will be the voting citizens of the future and how not to be manipulated by one side or another or by advertisers. Yeah. 
uh, Kurt Wavering member, um, David Halberstrom, who died recently, uh, in some of the interviews with him indicated, like you and other journalists, that he was really for the Vietnam War at the beginning. But when he got over there, got on helicopters, went out and saw what was happening, and was able to report it, that he, his view changed, of course. And I'm just wondering if the news now about Iraq and Afghanistan and other adventures like that are so distorted that we don't have that opportunity for learning. The thing about uh, Halberstam, I'm so glad you brought him up. He died in a tragic accident, one of the greatest reporters of the last few decades. And Halberstam did a lot of his best reporting after he left the New York Times and became an author, where he could take on a subject and, and play with it and explore it for a long period of time. Halberstam is one of many reporters who was a gung-ho hawk. And in fact, some of his early reporting is a little embarrassing, as I think he would admit. And it was that early reporting that got so many of my generation killed. Um, but Halberstam spent decades doing independent reporting, following the facts wherever he could find them. Uh, and it's truly a remarkable story. It's, it's interesting to see these guys that were at the New York Times and then went on or went away. Uh, a classic guy uh, like Halberstam, but even more so, is Seymour Hirsch. And Seymour Hirsch now is doing this great work for the New Yorker. If he were still at the New York Times, I don't think that stuff would have, I think a lot of that stuff never would have made it into print. Because remember, it was the front page of the New York Times that helped get us into the Iraq War. It was the coverage by Judith Miller and Michael Gordon. Gordon still has the first page. He writes these front page stories with unnamed sources telling us about what a threat Iran is, blaming the upheaval in Iraq on Iran now. And um, so uh, Seymour Hersh is a classic case of a guy like Halberstam went away, writes books, writes for magazines. He once made this statement, I'll never forget it. Seymour Hersh said, don't count on the New York Times to lead a social revolution. They won't even know about it for six months. <laughs> and that's the beauty of the independent media, is that they, they will get you the news when you need the news and not too late to matter. And so, the, I mean, the Halberstam and the New York Times role in getting us into Vietnam, and then later they published the Pentagon Papers and helped get us out of Vietnam. Uh, but, you know, you want the news in full when it matters, instead of getting it a few years after it's too late to impact policy. <clears throat> Bruce Curry, a City Club member. Uh, you didn't ever mention uh, Bill Moyer, and he was pressured and finally left uh, the NOW program. Um, the NOW program is continuing, but just a half an hour with another uh, leader. Yeah, but but he's back, uh, yes. doing doing things that you don't hear in other media, and the alternative media, um, uh, which I support, the uh, the KBU um, replays uh, uh, Barsamian and other um, uh, good good speak alternative speakers that that giving facts that you just simply don't see in our local papers. Right. Um, Air America, um, I, I'm putting up with the advertisement because I think they bring on excellent speakers. Yeah. What do you think of them? How many, how many minutes? Yeah. Shall you go real fast? Yeah. Um, I, I, I like all that you say about supporting independent media. They don't have commercial sponsors, you know, Air America does, but the rest of them don't. They need your support. And in terms of Bill Moyers, uh, Bill Moyers is a national treasure. Um, he's always felt pushed to the margins in public TV. Uh, he should be a regular analyst on the news hour, but they didn't really want him because he was too incisive. In answer to the Republican uh, who asked uh, those good questions earlier, the great thing about Bill Moyers is his independence. And when Bill Clinton was in power, the Clinton administration, he did a devastating critique of the Clinton administration and where they get their money and some of the corruption in that administration. You know what the title of that movie was, that, that special on PBS? The worst scandal wasn't about sex. And so uh, Bill Moyers is a treasurer. He's now getting back 
you know, with more regular programming on public TV, but if we had genuine independent public broadcasting with insulated funding, Bill Moyers never would have had to, you know, be pushed away and then he fights his way back in. But his, his recent documentary uh, about the median war, you can link to it if you go to FAIR's website, which is FAIR.org, and you can just watch it online if you missed it on PBS. Thank you very much. Once again, thank you to Jeff Cohen, and we're adjourned.